Okay, all the things are happening. Uh, welcome everyone uh, for those of you new faces. So excited to have you over on the Naturally Nourished virtual community space. Uh, today we're going to be talking about my 10 day real food detox. So this is a protocol that I developed back in 2009 that has continued to evolve over time. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking to you about why you need to consider nutritional detoxification, how the body's physiological processes work, uh, what are the actual biochemical pathways of detoxification, what nutrients influence those enzyme pathways, and what compounds are in our dirty industrialized environment that we want to be mindful of removing on a lifestyle and a dietary impact as well as symptoms of toxin overload. And then we're going to talk about supplementation strategy. Uh, we're gonna to start to dive into my protocol, which goes into resetting your metabolism, restoring your digestive health, and renewing your health on a whole body cellular level with that phase two enzyme support. So let's just rock into it. I'm going to do kind of a formal-ish uh, lecture for about an hour. A little bit of housekeeping for those of you that are joining me on the live Zoom classroom. The way to submit your questions is to click on the Q&A box. In the Q&A box is where uh, you will type in your question. You can choose to be anonymous or you can choose to put in a handle or a name. Becky will be directly uh, fielding those questions and sending direct links or answers. And then at the end, I will take a live Q&A. Becky will recall those that were most remarkable or those that were big common trends of confusion and will address the, the big things. And then for those of you that are joining me on Facebook Live, also same kind of deal. You can post your questions in the comments. We're gonna to try to field as many as we can. And the cool thing is with the Facebook Live audience, those will kind of stick there. So we'll definitely get, get to them over the next 24 hours, even as people view this later time. And then for those of you on YouTube watching this later, so many platforms. Uh, also, you can post your questions. We will work to get to them, but um, that may happen over the next couple of days. More real time, I would say, would be the uh, Facebook Live. All right, so let's talk about my 10 day real food detox approach. A little bit for those of you that are unfamiliar with me or heard about this from a friend who shared this link. My name is Allie Miller. I am a registered dietitian, a licensed dietitian, and a certified diabetes educator. What is unique about my background is that I went to a naturopathic college of medicine and I kind of bridge the allopathic or conventional medical model with the more naturopathic world in where a practice is guided by science yet grounded in scientific discovery. And I use functional integrative medicine where I'm always looking at addressing the root cause or underlying drivers of chronic conditions. So one of the underlying mechanisms that I'm looking into often is hindrance in the individual's detox process. So this could be a genetic SNP, like the individual may have an issue with methylation, like MTHFR, or it could be another SNP like GST1, which has a role with your glutathione, which has a, a really big impact on phase one and phase two detoxification. Um, we can also see issue just from excess stress to the toxin pathways based on your you know, occupation or exposure. Uh, we can also see in individuals that have had dynamic weight loss, if you lose weight somewhat rapidly and you're mobilizing your fat stores, your body holds, as we'll discuss this evening, a lot of endocrine hormone disrupting compounds in your body's fat and your body's fat itself is estrogenic. So we can get hormone dominance through the weight loss process and that's where detox can help to kind of mop up that mess that was left as a residue. And uh, detoxification is another approach to just balance hormone overall, regardless of if you've had that dynamic weight loss process. Um, aside from, of course, all my work with functional medicine, I uh, do have a lot of impact within the ketogenic diet space. I've been clinically using a ketogenic diet also since 2009. Uh, that's the same year that I came out with this first preliminary detox plan. I have a podcast called Naturally Nourished as well as a supplement line called Naturally Nourish. And I'm just thinking, I have my, my calm and clear on my desk, but I don't have my detox packs. I think I have pictures of them, so we'll be okay. Uh, the supplement line is called Naturally Nourished as well as my virtual clinic. 
and I'm the author of three books, all of them behind me, Naturally Nourished, which is a cookbook with a 12-week meal plan, uh, The Anti-Anxiety Diet, which is a nonfiction read on the science and strategy of drivers of mood disturbances, and um, it goes into inflammation, leaky gut, so much more, and then uh, just released uh, over this fall, The Anti-Anxiety Diet Cookbook. So let's talk detox. So we'll start a little bit scary and then we'll go into what you can do about it. Um, and the reality is that we are all just bombarded by toxins based on our industrialized lifestyle. Um, there are toxins that can be seen both external as well as toxins that we can actually make internally. So there's exogenous or endogenous toxins, if you will. Those that are external will come from exposure through diet, uh, as well as all the, the liquids that we take in. Chemical solvents, which can be seen in our um, environment. Uh, heavy metals, pesticides, herbicides, drugs, alcohol, there's many more. It's six billion pounds of toxins released in our environment annually, and that's definitely been on the rise from when that stat came out in 2012, I believe. And um, the reality is even if we're eating super clean and we're doing what we can, it is supportive for our body to upregulate the process that removes these industrialized toxins that we may not be um, taking in by choice. And then these internal toxins, these can be things like through dysbiosis, it could be bacteria or yeast overgrowth and the byproduct within that. Uh, we can also see this with byproducts of metabolism of different compounds. So on a continuous level, we're being exposed to dietary and environmental toxins. And over time, these have the ability to impair uh, very necessary metabolic pathways. There are also nutrients that can upregulate the pathways that clear these toxins from our body. And unfortunately, in you know, the standard American diet, or really where most people are in, in these, again, I keep calling it industrialized society, is that we're both taxed in the sense that we're eating a less nutrient-dense diet. Even produce, we know, because the lack of mineralization in our soil lacks the nutrient density it once had in the past decades. And then we're bombarded with an excess of toxins. So we're nutrient deficient, yet we're overburdened. So it's kind of this double-edged sword. Um, and if the toxins aren't removed from the body, um, we can be looking at varied conditions. Um, anything from headaches to muscle aches and pains, joint pain, uh, skin conditions, uh, ex eczema, psoriasis, allergy and flu-like symptoms, chronic fatigue, weight gain, irritability, mental confusion, depression, anxiety, and brain fog, bloating, indigestion, bowel irregularity. We can see a lot of neurological impact, especially with the pesticides and herbicides, uh, specifically Roundup, which is one of those chemicals we'll talk about a little bit, used in the GMO crops at high amounts. We're finally starting to see litigation acknowledging this crop chemical to be a known neurotoxin and, and we're starting to see billions of dollars in lawsuits um, for people that have worked as gardeners or people that have been exposed in elementary schools on the groundskeepers and such. And neurological conditions would include Parkinson's disease as well as Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis. Uh, autoimmune conditions can be tied to toxin burden or overload. Uh, cancer, diabetes, and metabolic conditions, including insulin resistance. And then uh, beyond neurological conditions, there's um, nerve damage like neuropathy um, and muscle damage like myopathy. And the list kind of goes on. So here's just some final stats of like, okay, but still, 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 I don't think this could be me. Um, tap water in 42, tape, 42 states, excuse me, was contaminated with 140 unregulated chemicals. Um, the Environmental Protection Agency did an adipose tissue, that's a, a test of the individual's fat um, within their body. Adipose tissue survey of 33,000 US residents, and that's a pretty substantial population, so not very small. And they found 100% of them to have stearine, um, xylene, these are known benzenes, okay? So these can be coming from petrochemicals. Um, there's 15 billion plus pounds produced annually, so I told you this is beyond the six billion pounds being released. 
Um, and these are known carcinogens. So 100% of the 33,000 people tested had these carcinogenic compounds stored in their fat stores. And again, that's why liberation of fat loss can drive disruption within our endocrine hormone system when we liberate these toxins that were once stored. And body fat and really the obesity hypothesis takes into account that some individuals may be holding extra body weight in their body's attempt to protect their vital organs from the influence of those toxins. So the body just starts to store fat to kind of insulate it. Um, 212 toxins were found in the urine of people, um, and these include things like acrylamide, these include things like arsenic, BPA, uh, perchlorate, which is in rocket fuel, perfluorinated chemicals, um, which are in your nonstick cookware, uh, flame retardants, which can be seen in mattresses and upholstery products, uh, volatile compounds just kind of throughout the household it, within your cleaning products, your fragrances, and so forth. And these are seen in the urine as a byproduct, but again, a lot of these compounds then also are stored within the body fat as well. Um, we see PCBs that have been made illegal back in 1979, even in the snow on the top layers of the Andes Mountains. And that kind of goes back to greenhouse gas carbon emissions and things really not being able to escape our environment and continuing to um, come down in our um, precipitation. And then the umbilical cord blood of newborn babies, so not even exposed yet to the environment because mom passes so much through the placenta, um, have an average of 200 industrialized pollutants and chemicals, according to a study by the Environmental Workers Group. I'm going to actually shift gears and stand up as I continue talking to you guys. I have a standing desk, so sometimes I get a little stir crazy towards the end of my day when I get this up here. All right, so um, the standard American diet itself, or the SAD diet, is also a huge source of toxicity, of course. Uh, there's just so many unregulated chemicals, and you guys know that I'm really passionate about using this concept, and I like the phrase chemical shitstorm. Um, kind of along the lines of Michael Pollan, if we don't recognize a food, if our great-grandmother didn't eat it, there are foods, which are whole real foods, and we'll define that further this evening, and then there are food-like substances. And unfortunately, in today's society, we really are normalizing, for whatever reason, the consumption of these food-like substances that aren't real whole foods. And of the products that hit our food market, a lot of them have ingredients where only a third of them have actually been reviewed. Uh, Becky and I just did a podcast episode that dropped this morning on uh, Beyond, I don't know, it was the Impossible Burger. Um, and in the Impossible Burger, this is the company that's very pro-GMO. They have like a uh, legume-derived uh, GMO heme, basically to make like an iron-like bleed from the burger. And this has not even been really fully reviewed or even recognized as grass. And GRASS is a term that we use in the States, and it stands for generally recognized as safe. So generally recognized as safe is not exciting to me. <laughs> like, I don't know about you, but I want things in my household that are absolutely recognized as safe, not generally. And then mind you, two thirds of the other ingredients aren't even hitting that criteria. And we know that so many of the compounds that we allow in the States are banned in the European Union, Japan, and other um, uh, countries. So I'll get into that in a moment. Excess sugar is consumed. So throughout my 10 day detox, you're going to be going at least low glycemic, which is a great reset button during this timestamp of the holidays. A great way to kind of ring out and not just let yourself roll into a wash month of December. Um, so you're going to be at least restricting your carbohydrates at 75 grams a day, max of 90 grams a day. Um, and that still is a low glycemic diet. There's also a protocol for a ketogenic approach, which would be 30 grams of carbs or less per day. And then you, based on your metabolic flexibility, may find some middle ground that works best for you. And that's all within reason. The big emphasis of the detox is eating whole real foods and finding a balance within being hypocaloric or low calorie so your body actually is in a breakdown mode. But we all, well, not we all, I don't, and hopefully most of you who are listening, don't overconsume sugar, but in the States, and especially during this time of the year, high risk for overindulgence and um, binge eating and the vicious cycle of 
cookie addiction where guilt and shame follows the intake and it just kind of rolls you through the month. Um, average American consumes about 175 pounds of sugar a year. And of the additives con consumed, um, we see about 14 pounds coming from coloring and flavorants. That's quite extreme when we're talking about the way that products really add up in your body. 90 plus percent of the corn and soy that is grown in our country is genetically modified. This is why both are removed from my anti-anxiety diet approach and also during the detox because the GMO form of corn and soy is called Roundup Ready. And what that means is it can withstand higher amounts of the Roundup glyphosate compound, the chemical compound that is given um, by Monsanto, the same crop that makes the seed also makes conveniently the chemical that is uh, going to be given to that crop at higher level. And that means higher residue on those products. So regardless of if the genetic um, you know, modification itself on the, on the DNA level is harmful for the individual. The application of the Roundup to that type of seed is most definitely harmful. And we're looking at glyphosate residue uh, released at 3 billion pounds from 1974 when it was introduced into 19, uh, excuse me, into 2014. And that goes higher as the years go on. Uh, we've started to see, like I said, some litigation, um, some cases where we are seeing to Supreme Court level financial um, feedback and, and people winning lawsuits against Monsanto, the producer. Um, they've started to pay out about $2.4 billion and that continues to, to be fought. So just as we get an oil change in our vehicle to ensure that our engine runs appropriately, it is strategic to upregulate the nutrients that drive phase one and phase two, you'll learn what those are tonight, detox pathways in your body. Because like I said, it's very difficult to navigate these inhalants, these environmental uh, players. And we're gonna start today with diet strategy. We're going to emphasize and take you next level with nutritional supplementation. And then after the detox, I want you to continue the framework of what is a whole food versus what is a food-like substance. So one last thing on toxicity within the food um, system. So the uh, body that regulates toxicity is called the Toxic Substance Control Act. And it sounds like a good thing for consumers, but it actually protects the producers. So it denies citizens and federal regulators information on how chemical compounds are made, uh, what the effects of all of the studies have been. So the producer themselves can cherry pick the studies that show that things are less harmful, submit that for that grass approval. And um, just one example of a compound is brominated vegetable oil. So brominated vegetable oil um, back in 2012 got banned from Gatorade based on a petition. And this is a really big emphasis to keep in mind. You know, we all vote with our dollar. And the more that we choose single whole ingredients and stop eating processed chemical shit storms, hopefully the better, you know, opportunity in our schools, our hospitals and institutions, as well as within our households and our family members of less chronic illness. Um, so brominated vegetable oil is used to keep colorants um, from dissipating to kind of keep a consistent color. It's used in soft drinks as well. So here's an image of Mountain Dew and you can see that highlight on that brominated vegetable oil. Well, it's a known endocrine disruptor. It actually interferes with iodine storage in the body. Um, it uh, has been linked to neurological symptoms, infertility, thyroid problems, likely due to that uh, iodine impact, abnormal areas of heart tissue, and an early start to puberty. And so again, it's not just that that Mountain Dew has sugar. It's not just that it has yellow 40. There's these compounding influences of things that don't belong in our body that need to be removed. And I'll go off my soapbox. Okay, so again, that's not food freedom, giving yourself chemical shit storms. Food freedom is actually nourishing yourself and empowering your body to feel the best it can. And that's really the perspective that I'd emphasize as you go into doing this 10-day detox, is the fact that I, I wanted to put a slide out on this and I just didn't get time. Um, but you know, think of this 10-day detox as a delivery of food freedom and a way to honor your body. It's I get to have this matcha latte. It's I get to sip this bone broth, not I can't have that disgusting candy in the break room or 
woe is me, I can't participate in this event. You know, go up, show up, make the memories and the connections and be strategic and mindful with your consumption. So a little bit more on endocrine disruptors. Um, endocrine disruptors are seen, I think of as three Ps, plastics, pesticides, and perfumes. Uh, so we can see these in industrialized chemicals, household products, uh, fragrances of any form, personal care like beauty, uh, cosmetics, food additives, pharmaceuticals, and plastics, I already said that. Um, I will be sending you a link to the blog, or maybe I'll feature that this week on my Instagram that has products I love, like for instance, Branch Basics, Cleaner Beauty, and what have you, um, that you can explore to support reducing your toxic load. So let's talk about now the biochemistry of how your body detoxifies and maybe start first with a little bit of anatomy and physiology. Um, so the, the digestive process plays a huge role with the detoxification process because if we have digestive stress, if we have leaky gut, um, if we have damage in our gut lining, we're going to be overburdened with higher particle load in our bloodstream for our body to deal with. And that usually means more inflammatory process through your immune system. Now, this can distract your immune system from regulating things like abnormal cell activity, or um, it can distract your liver from upregulating the processes it needs to, to uh, conjugate or remove toxins from your body and so forth. So digestion is really important both to reduce the toxin burden, um, to not distract the body through its processes, and also to provide nutrient density to support the biochemical process. So the more enhanced or supported your digestive system is, the more nutrients you absorb in that process. So chewing is a very important part of the puzzle. We have um, digestive enzymes that start in our mouth, and I talk all the time about you know, how I hate non-caloric sweeteners, and that's because you actually have taste receptors in your tongue that signal other physiology pathways. Like there's a taste receptor called GLP-1. And when GLP-1 in your tongue tastes monk fruit or stevia, it doesn't care that you didn't get a carbohydrate gram. It doesn't care that your glucose hasn't gone up. It's going to respond with, you know, a response to the pancreas the glucagon impact on blood sugar, and you're going to likely experience an insulin release, uh, and you're also likely going to then re respond with the blood sugar crash, and that's where some people get dynamic negative physiological feedback from non-caloric sweeteners. Well, we also make digestive enzymes in our tongue, and so we can start to break down food particles so that we can absorb their nutrition, and then mechanically, with the chewing process, we're breaking down food, right? Creating more surface area, more absorption uh, space as we break down the, the larger fibers and such. Um, so chewing adequately is really essential. And then um, we swallow through the esophagus, the food carries to the stomach, and that stomach pouch is supposed to be highly acidic. It's supposed to have a pH of one to two. This would literally digest a copper penny. Um, and so it's supposed to really be able to break down um, and activate protein, protein breaking down enzymes. It's supposed to have hydrochloric acid in the present level that can activate nutritional enzymes that really help to break down foods further. And when we buffer our stomach acidity with over-the-counter stuff, Stuff like Tums or we're taking PPI drugs like Protonix or Nexium, this over time, and we've seen in research study after study, this is going to deplete mineralization in the body. It reduces our ability to absorb nutrients, including calcium, zinc, B12, a lot of those mood stabilizers and nutrients that we see very essential in the aging process. So maintaining ample stomach acid is really important. If you're on one of those medications, definitely check out, I have a blog um, on heartburn specifically and my uh, hydrochloric acid challenge. And I would definitely recommend that you take Digest Aid, which is my digestive enzyme product. It has HCL in there as well as ox bile, so it doesn't create acidity, but it does provide that perfect juice in the stomach to break down the food particles at your meals. Um, it also has compounds to break down gluten and dairy and uh, proteins, fats, and carbohydrates so that you have less bloating and distension at your meal times and you're able to absorb your nutrients efficiently. Then once the food passes through the stomach pouch into the small intestine, it takes a windy, curvy um, ride through our GI tract. 
And this is where we'd have stress if we had leaky gut, um, which can occur from excessive caffeine, medications, especially like your NSAID drugs or anti-inflammatories, like Aleve, naproxen sodium, Celebrex. Um, NSAIDs are often given based on inflammation, and inflammation may be caused based on consumption of pro-inflammatory foods or excess overload of toxins in the body. So this could be more root cause. And then there's natural anti-inflammatory that you can layer in if needed, like my super turmeric or inflammasome, and these will not destroy the gut tissue. You'll also see this is an emphasis in the protocol for resetting digestive health, why I encourage gelatin, collagen, and bone broth throughout the process. Um, and then in the colon is actually the third phase of detox, which we haven't really hit that yet. But this is where we start excretion, of course, in our fecal matter. And the colon plays a huge role with regulating estrogen dominance in the body. It plays a huge role with removing some of those hormone disrupting compounds. And both fiber and fluid, as well as maintaining motility or bowel movement, are all important to address that. So we have two biochemical phases of detoxification. There's activation in the liver, and this requires a process called hydroxylation. Um, this is where we convert basically a fat-soluble toxin that was dormant and sleeping in our body's fat reserves, but through a nutritional detox, we go through a hypocaloric or calorie-restricted approach to start to break down and catabolize, and in that process, in the light of the nutrient density we're consuming and the focused strategic intake, we're going to be upregulating that release process. And so hydroxylation is going to be um, particular enzyme pathways that make this fat soluble toxin water soluble. And this really activates that toxin again that was once dormant. Um, so it requires hydrolysis, hydration, reduction, and oxidation as the biochemical reactions. Uh, these are all the nutrients that you'll see required, which are within the Reset, Restore, Renew Detox packs. Um, and then I wanted to make a note, a note here, a note, a note here that this is my big uh, thing against celery juice. So I did this um, IGTV on uh, celery juice not being a detox, and I always often say, a juice cleanse is not detox, and that usually comes with this phase two activity that I'll get to in a moment. But celery juice actually has a compound called furacumarin, and uh, the furacumarin actually blocks cytochrome P450 enzymes in the liver, which are the known primary detox pathways. And this is the same enzyme pathway that grapefruit influences. So you'll see in my protocol, you can use citrus, including lime and lemon, but no uh, grapefruit um, and limiting your orange because of that interference with cytochrome P450. That's why statin drugs, for instance, will say don't take with grapefruit or don't consume grapefruit while taking this drug. Um, because when we block cytochrome P450, it can influence the metabolism of medications, either reducing their efficacy or increasing their um, half-life. Um, and this can, over time, if we're blocking phase one enzyme activity, like with celery juice, with that bucurmin, um, we actually can create like a damning effect of our toxins. And this is why people will say that celery juice helps with like autoimmune flares, because many people that deal with autoimmune activity in their body or deal with chronic inflammation, they have excess phase one activity with inadequate phase two. So what that means is they're activating toxins at a high level, but phase two is the encapsulation and excretion. So when we're looking at phase two of detox, we're looking at sulfur containing amino acids, and this is why you also can't do a juice cleanse. Um, you know, the only sulfur containing vegetables are like your aliums, which are important, your onions, shallots, garlic, leeks, um, all that kind of sulfur, right? And then you get sulfur support also through your cruciferous vegetables, like your um, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, you name it, that whole family has sulfur. But you're actually getting sulfur containing amino acids higher in things like egg yolk and in the consumption of grass-fed beef liver um, and protein because they're, they're looking for amino acids. The most biologically available amino acids are in your animal products, including grass-fed whey. So your protocol is going to include animal product the whole way through. It does remove dairy, and we'll talk about why in a little bit, um, but it does include uh, animal products the whole way through, and that's because of that phase two enzyme support. 
Now, getting back to celery juice. So celery juice blocks the activation, and that's why people feel better short term and say it helps them. But they're just creating more muck in their tank for more toxin overload. What would be superior instead of blocking that activation, allowing the activation, but putting heavier weighted support on the excretion phase two. So you're actually helping the body get rid of versus damming up those toxins and preventing the activation. Hopefully that kind of makes sense. And, and what we've seen in research is individuals that have uh, inadequate phase two uh, detox enzymes will often have more oxidative stress, more inflammation, um, because basically in that phase one, that's creating more free radical activity. So we'll see more oxidative stress even down to the level of DNA, and this can interfere with an individual's cell production, and we can see cellular mutations and higher susceptibility towards cancers. So detox don't. Obviously, I already said celery, celery juice, right? Um, we're also avoiding harsh laxatives. These can be disrupting to the GI. They can cause more leaky gut, which can cause more harm than health. Uh, they can also throw off mineral and electrolytes and cause dehydration, so don't mess with those. Uh, restrictive long-term diets of only fruit or vegetable juice or water. You're not going to get the phase two detox enzyme support. Um, you also can start to get over time muscle wasting, um, especially if you're incorporating fruit juice because then you're preventing your body from going ketogenic. So you're not going to be getting that um, lean body mass maintenance that you would if you were fasting on more of a keto approach. Um, we, we want to see autophagy or the upregulation of the cellular process that occurs during a fast and that often will help the immune system to kind of surveillance the body and recycle the functional parts and get rid of those dysfunctional parts of the cells. But again, we can do that with calorie restriction during our detox. We, don't, we do want to still have an abundance of strategic nutrients. So I wouldn't recommend a prolonged fast, and we're talking more like a 12-12 or a 16-8 to get into, into your food as medicine goals during this protocol. So approaches and things that we're focusing on doing. Um, we do want to incorporate some form, again, of intermittent fasting and calorie restriction because we do want to be in a catabolism uh, process. That means kind of breaking down from our tissue versus anabolic building. Um, so we can incorporate intermittent fasting of a minimum of 12-12, which means 12 hours without food. So if you cut off at 8 p.m., you don't eat in the morning until 8 a.m. That's the bare minimum. You might consider to take it a step further and do like a 16-8. This is what I do most days, um, except for I do a 16-8 with a fat fast because I, I run lower body um, percent fat. And so I need to have that fat during that fasted window so I don't drop too low hormone. That'll be based on you and your individual body composition. Um, so if you're looking for weight loss, you could do a 16-8 where you just drink green tea or ribose tea in that um, you know, four hour window from rise. So maybe let's say for instance, you cut off at 8 p.m. from intake, um, then you wouldn't eat until noon the next day. And that would be your breaking of the fast meal one. And then you'd have a second meal and you try to get in your food as medicine goals within those two meals and potentially one snack. And then again, the morning could be just teas um, or lemon and ginger water or things like that. That would be um, more just kind of the spark, the, the digestive process or um, the liver enzyme activity. Um, regardless of your carb restriction, I want you to pair carbohydrate foods with a protein or a healthy fat. So if you're not going to have carbohydrate foods and do the ketogenic protocol, that's absolutely fine. If you are to have carbohydrates within your protocol and consume fruits, then I'd want you to make sure that you never have a naked carb, which would mean if you're having like an apple, I'd like you to have uh, fresh ground almond butter on that. Not almond butter that has palm oil in it, that would not be detox friendly, right? So you can't do like Justin's almond butter. You wanna do the like grind your own almond butter at Whole Foods or your natural grocery store where you push the button and it's the only ingredient is roasted almonds, right? Um, there's a couple brands out there that, that do that same thing, but um, and a big thing that I love as a brand is F-Bomb Nut Butter Packs. Um, so you can always incorporate those. Uh, those are great throughout the detox, all but the chocolate flavor would work really well through the whole 10-day protocol. So that's an option too, to do like in the mid-morning. 
Um, include adequate protein to maintain lean body mass. And also the protein goal is to get in those sulfur containing amino acids. Um, and so we're looking at trying to get minimum uh, 60 grams of protein a day. Most of us wanting to get upwards of a minimum of 80 grams a day. And the ebook, which has 60 plus pages of information, really teaches you about exchanges and one ounce equaling seven grams and kind of what that looks like. I want you to consume the nutrients that, that are required to support your system's detox process. I want you to remove toxin, toxic foods. And then again, you do need to be some form of hypocaloric, um, but I don't want most of you dipping below 600 calories because that may put your body into more stress and benefit, um, especially in this time of the year. I think better to be a little bit more gentle and focus on the abundance and more of a perspective change on clean eating and then just being mildly hypocaloric. So the importance of foods being, you know, sourced locally and organic are super important. Um, and this comes back to that whole, again, concept of like dead food and food-like substances. And there's always a good, better, best application. So we could look at organic baby carrots, right? Um, and then we could look at carrots with their greens intact. And um, we're looking at really different nutrient density because the carrots with their green intact are going to have a shorter shelf life. Um, you know, they give actually to the greens. So if you put those in your fridge, you're gonna lose the turgidity, like the carrot itself will get really rubbery and soft um, because it's giving its water up to its stem. Um, now, when the greens are break, broken off, that enhances the storage time. So that means that the harvest time could have been later. So you may be already losing some nutrient density. And then when we're talking about these baby carrots, they're of course pushed through, you know, um, uh, screens that cut them into that baby size and then they're dipped into a um, pH that's going to regulate them from oxidizing. Um, so that could be interfering with the microbiome. You're definitely not getting mineral from the soil or good living bacteria from the soil like you would in the ridges of your farmer's market carrots. So it's a kind of double-edged sword again, good, better, best. Um, both of them being acceptable technically within this 10-day detox because an organic carrot is a single ingredient and is somewhat of a whole food, but, but there's better. And that would be going for the ones with the greens intact with the dirt on them. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, so the big shift we're seeing in our farming, and we talked about that a little bit in today's podcast, was you know the loss of topsoil and the concern that potentially we only have 60 harvests left in the United States. Um, which would basically mean the end to all food security within many people of my age and 35 generation, or maybe just after my lifespan. Um, so that's very concerning. And the issue is that in a industrialized monocrop approach of farming, we are using soil as just a dead anchor. And, you know, we're just amending the soil by adding very simple um, nutrients like nitrogen to fertilize. And we're not getting the complexity of mineralization. We're not using the mineral as the soil as an exchange of nutrients with the root system. So you're not getting as robust of roots from the plants themselves. And um, we are losing the soil microbe activity and the topsoil. Um, we also see that when foods are grown sustainably, not only does that retain the soil and work with the land, when foods are grown sustainably and organically with less input on a chemical analog approach, um, that there's 81% less, uh, less pesticide residue in organic as opposed to conventional foods. Um, and we're concerned again, because a lot of these pesticides, herbicides, fungicides can be neurotoxins, um, they can be metabolic disruptors, and they can lead to chronic disease. So what is a whole food? Can you imagine it growing? Um, what has, how many of its ingredients does it have? Uh, how many ingredients are in this product? Are all of its edible parts still intact? What's been done to it since harvest, okay? So again, we have the baby carrot from the whole carrot. Now take raw and filtered honey, um, which is pulled from the honeycomb. Um, take a gray bee maple syrup, take a date, and then take erythritol, <laughs> take swerve, uh, take monk fruit, right? To make an odorless, flavorless, uh, all perfect chemical molecular structure white powder from an ingredient like corn, a lot of things have happened in that process. There's a lot of edible parts 
debatable based on corn, but you know, <laughs> that have been removed. There's been a lot of hydroxylation, chemical centrifuging, solutes for extraction, bleaches, dyes. Um, so not a whole real food. Um, so you guys know I'm very anti non-caloric sweeteners. Maybe that's the one change, the one band-aid you tear off, those of you keto warriors, um, with this 10-day detox that you keep out for the new year. Um, but I'm, I'm really into this mindset of, again, you can actually use during my 10-day detox very small amounts of uh, robust gravy maple or um, raw and filtered honey, as well as dates. Um, and these are reasonable because they are whole real foods and we're keeping them still low glycemic within the delivery, but I don't want you using any uh, chemical shit storms or food-like substances. So nutrients that are required for phase one detox. We're looking at a lot of B vitamin support. And so we can see these high in our meat products and our liver is a really powerhouse of B vitamins. Uh, we have fantastic blog recipes for like a liver pate, um, a uh, peanut butter, peanuts aren't allowed, but you can use almond butter in replacement of a pate as well with liver, which is fantastic. Uh, avocado, leafy greens, uh, lentils and beans, if those work for your GI tract. Um, if you haven't had them in for a while, it might be a welcomed addition. Um, see how your GI, if you like removed them with an AIP protocol or you removed them from a paleo approach, maybe doing a lentil soup or black bean soup might be something worth introducing. If you get negative feedback, pull it back out. No big deal. Um, but B vitamins are really fantastic. And B vitamins are often depleted when we're eating any food that has flour in it because really the whole synthetic re-enrichment of flour-based foods happen when we started to see birth defects once we started making white flour because it stripped the grain of its B vitamins. And then we started bringing folic acid, the synthetic form of folate, which does not work the same in the body as the folate that is naturally occurring in liver or in leafy greens um, or that the body's able to methylate. Um, and so the addition of folic acid into, in, into any of these enriched foods, which is like, you know, any bread, even if it's like foodies organic, it still has the synthetic re-enrichment because it's flour based. Um, so be really mindful of that within your household. There's just, you know, over 40% of individuals that have a high MTHFR gene. And that basically means that their body can't use that form of that nutrient. And that makes them more susceptible to the impact of the MTHFR, which can be mood disturbances, neurological impact, infertility, miscarriage, um, and uh, insomnia, ADHD, and, and so much more. So removing synthetically enriched foods and using a bioavailable form of a B-complex is going to be supportive. Um, and like my B-complex through the Naturally Nourished line has the Nature Made Folate, which is going to be a combination of uh, folinic, um, cal calcium fol folinic um, form, as well as the methylfolate. Flavonoids found in organic um, fruits and vegetables are supported for phase one detox activity. Um, we're looking at also antioxidants in our ACE, uh, really great source again, liver, carotenoids we can look for in these foods, so the orange flesh foods. Glutathione is a master of the antioxidant wheel, if you will, or lineage with vitamin C being like the baby sister. Uh, CoQ10 is in the middle as is selenium, vitamin E is in there, and glutathione is at the tip, tip, top. It is the largest, um, most powerful antioxidant, which is known to reduce calcification in tissues, also can uh, support reduced oxidative stress, being an antioxidant, um, and drives both phase one and phase two detox pathways. Uh, we can see this in the non-denatured grass-fed whey. That's why the whey is used in some of the bundles for the detox because grass-fed whey that's non-denatured, meaning low heat processed, is the most supportive protein to use during a detox. Um, and then aside from liver. Um, and then uh, we're looking at fresh fruits and vegetables. Avocado is a great form of glutathione as well. Branched chain amino acids coming again in the grass-fed way as well as our animal proteins. So our red meats, poultry, fish, eggs, and so forth. 
So phase one activation includes all those nutrients I just mentioned and may look like mineral powerhouse and CoQ10 boost of raw oysters. That's a great way to navigate a happy hour. Um, you could do a cup of green tea and half a dozen oysters at a restaurant with a friend if you need to dine out during this period of time. That's one that you know will be super clean. Um, red meat um, is gonna be really rich in a lot of these nutrients as well, as I mentioned. Uh, herbs, seasoning, spices, uh, the Brazil nuts for selenium in there, and starting to see your cruciferous vegetables and that rainbow of antioxidants. We're looking at Eindol 3 carbonyls, which are the I3C uh, sulfur powerhouses of your um, cruciferous vegetables. So this includes cabbage, broccoli, Brussels sprouts. Uh, we are looking at limonene, which is found in your tangerines, um, caraway seeds, and dill. Glutathione again on here. Um, Omega-3 fatty acids are a big emphasis here, including chia seeds, uh, fish oil, and flax seeds. So yes, you would totally keep taking your EPA DHA extra if that's in your supplement regimen. Um, amino acids, again, a big emphasis in phase two. So we're looking at a high quality whole foods based diet that includes ample healthy sources of protein, fresh fruits and vegetables and antioxidants that benefit the liver. So in this encapsulation process, we're looking at that glutathione again, glycine, which is huge in bone broth. Uh, so we have our bone broth uh, recipe there, taurine, uh, glutamine, cysteine, methionine, and N-acetylcysteine, getting all that sulfur, the egg yolk, the garlic, the um, uh, avocado, I guess the avocado hollandaise or some form of a dip there, which again, another kind of food for thought. If you're looking at a product, all of the ingredients should be identifiable. So there are like some mayos that you are able to use that use olive oil or avocado oil plus egg yolk plus XYZ, and all those are identifiable. And there'll be some that are semi-clean that will not work, and then definitely those that have GMO soy as the oil and have sodium benzonate as a preservative, and that's far from okay, right? So we kind of will look for options, and maybe we omit and we follow the mayo recipe on the blog and make from scratch for the first time. So importance of clean protein, um, the big emphasis here is that the omega-3 status is going to be superior in grass-fed meats as opposed to conventional fed. Uh, we're talking about conjugated linoleic acids here, and these CLAs are able to boost metabolism, increase lean body mass, and can also um, aid insulin uh, function in the body, so help with blood sugar regulation. Um, we see more minerals and more vitamin E, more B vitamins from ruminants that are eating grasses as opposed to grain fed. And we see the same thing in wild caught fish versus farm raised. Omega-3 levels plummet, toxicity goes up in the farm raised fish. So why hormone free and antibiotic free? Um, the big thing of course is that this impacts both bioavailability of antibiotic availability in like the critical care, acute care setting in our hospitals. We're now seeing high amounts of antibiotic resistant bacteria like MRSA and C. diff. Um, we're seeing that the antibiotics that are used in the US to animals, 74% of them are used prophylactic based on the dingy, disgusting living environment that those animals are raised. So the animals aren't even getting diseases, we're just throwing antibiotic at them. That goes in the groundwater, it creates superbugs, and then humans don't have access to those when needed. Um, I'm not a proponent, as you know, of antibiotics. I think of them as like a last resort, but there's time and place for them. Um, so really it's, it's the focus on impact of human health on the inability to use antibiotics that I'm primarily concerned about of voting with my dollar for antibiotic free. And then growth hormone, we're talking about impact on the um, endocrine system. We're talking about concern about the uh, nutrient density because growth timeline is going to be increased with growth hormone. Um, it probably means less maturation and may impact uh, nutrient complexity within the, the animal that you're consuming. And why would greens be considered a superfood? So you'll see pretty much the whole 10-day detox, and that's another one that I do with my 12-week uh, Buddhist medicine um, keto program, is two to three cups of greens per day. So this can be done through the base of a salad. It can be done um, to add it to your eggs in the morning in a scramble. 
It can be done as a tray of kale chips or whatever else you want to do in between, adding into a protein shake or smoothie. Um, you know, the phyto compounds are what we say like eat the rainbow. Each compound is going to have a unique antioxidant. So like anthocyanins with your purple, uh, lutein we think of with your green, lycopene with your red and so forth. And um, when we're talking about leafy greens, think of what happens in the season of fall. The leaves actually go from that green, yellow, orange, red, and then, you know, drop. So greens actually have that phyto compound capacity of the whole rainbow. There's a lot of nutrient density and antioxidant density. Um, so really great and, and low calorie density. So you're getting a lot of volume, a lot of nourishment without a lot of calorie impacts. So you can still stay hypochlorite to get the outcomes of the release and the detox. Uh, greens also have a lot of insoluble fiber, which can help with um, the impact of colon helping with the detox process and bulking. And sea vegetables are important as well. Um, they're going to have high minerality. So we're, we're looking at like 30% of every bite of sea vegetables um, in minerals can be 100 times the um, minerals that we would see in land. Um, and sea vegetables tend to have a significant impact on our iodine, calcium, and iron. Cruciferous vegetables, I think I hit them pretty hard, um, but I wanna call out the goal as you go up the bell curve, especially in today's five through eight, we're emphasizing one and a half cups daily during the detox. Um, and so this could be, uh, this would be cooked, generally speaking, so a full cup and a half cooked. Um, it might be curried cauliflower, it might be a little bit of broccoli sprout, like a quarter cup of broccoli sprout on top of a salad, and then doing the rest of it cooked. It could be Brussels sprouts um, sauteed with leeks, um, you know, these foods also lowering calories and carbohydrates, but very nutrient dense, very high in the sulfur containing compounds that support that phase two detox. And that's when we see a lot of research on the DNA protecting influence and cancer fighting influence from these cruciferous vegetables. Uh, sulforaphane is a compound that plays a role with activating um, the myrosinase, excuse me, is an enzyme that plays a role with activating sulforaphane, which is the really kind of powerhouse antioxidant in broccoli and the Brocco Detox Supplement in the Naturally Nourished line is a whole food detox support that I recommend if you're dealing with estrogen dominance, hormone imbalance, um, if you just know that you have a, a generalized exposure to toxins or any family history of cancer, especially estrogen related cancers, a good thing to take as an insurance policy like one, one twice daily um, and that has that sulforaphane support to really have that protective influence. If you have thyroid issues, if you're hypothyroid, um, and especially if your thyroid is off and not um, managed at this time, definitely be mindful of more cooked versus raw, and you might reduce slightly the amount of the intake of the cruciferous. I wouldn't worry though on that supplement level, the Brocco Detox with hypothyroid. Aliums, as I mentioned before, these are your onions, your shallots, your leeks, your garlic. These are potent flavonoids. Um, these are particular compounds that produce an antioxidant glutathione, that grandmama antioxidant, right? And that's what helps with both phase one and phase two detox support. We also know that turmeric is a big player that upregulates glutathione in the body. But the alium family, like garlic, onions, shallots, a lot of them are antimicrobial, antifungal. Um, Becky will be using them all in our um, master cleanse, not to be confused with the detox, but that's like a ferment of the spiciest peppers and um, horseradish and these raw onions, garlic, and she wears like safety goggles and everything to make it. And it's been said to eradicate the plague um, because it has such powerful, unique antioxidants and antibacterial uh, properties. Um, onions also provide quercetin, which aids in histamine activity in the body, seasonal allergies. And that's also seen in our BioC Plus. So BioC Plus has more of a whole food detox approach where it has um, bioflavonoids from the citrus peel. And then it also has that quercetin to aid with histamine in the body. Um, so that's something to consider if that's a big area that you're dealing with at this time of the year. All right, phase three of detox. So we've gone through activation, encapsulation, and now we're moving towards excretion pathways. So we're looking to support the body with fiber, fluid, bitters, which drive bioflow. So this is like Bragg's raw apple cider vinegar. <clears throat> also looking at diuretics. Um, so you may include as a food form, 
cucumber or celery, but you wouldn't be doing copious amounts of this as a juice thing, right? So why food matters. Um, the big picture again is that antioxidants in a high amount of the diet are going to inhibit the oxidative damage. Um, so if you think of, for a good example of an antioxidant, think of an avocado browning or an apple browning. And you put lemon juice on that apple slice or you put uh, lime juice on your guacamole or your avocado. That's vitamin C, ascorbic acid. That's vitamin C blocking the oxidative damage or the browning effect that occurs from oxygenation, oxygen light exposure, right? So you're basically sealing that produce with the vitamin C as a shield to protect its integrity. And that actually can aid our bodies down to the level of our DNA. Um, so oxidation can occur at the vascular level, the cellular level, um, into the way that our cells, like I said, replicate. So when we're getting more phyto compounds, from our fresh fruits and vegetables and our teas and our herbs and our spices, this is helping to provide, uh-oh, I think my three naturals fell or something. Okay, um, this is gonna help to provide a high amount of these phyto compounds to basically shield and protect us. And um, bioflavonoids, again, are kind of pigment oriented. You're gonna wanna be very um, aggressive with your seasonings for detox. So we're talking about high amounts of not only those aliens, but also turmeric, ginger, anti-inflammatories like cinnamon, rosemary, thyme. All these are going to have beneficial properties for the body. Throughout the entire 10-day detox, you're going to avoid coffee. I know a lot of you though will get a really beneficial impact on your sleep, which will favorably impact your cravings, um, as well as your metabolism and the way that your body detoxifies. So it's worth it um, pulling out coffee. I do allow though a little bit of caffeine um, through green tea um, and matcha, which is higher caffeine, but just deliver differently with that L-theanine. Um, and we just see such benefit on the AGCG compound in, in green tea, supporting metabolism and really activating the, that um, body fat burn. So I, I had to keep that in there. But that might be a great ritual swap out for a lot of you. Alcohol is going to be out after day eight on days nine and 10. I said, okay, you could have a glass um, of dry farm red wine, uh, meaning you know wine that's tested for uh, glyphosate, wine that's tested for and, and doesn't allow added sugars. Um, that would be a, a reasonable option of like a Pinot Noir, which might support the microbiome, but let's be fair, alcohol is a known you know, neurotoxin, so it depends on what type of lifestyle behavior you've changed to get here and what makes sense to you at the end of the day. I really like to look at this detox as every time you do it, you're going to continue to kind of like onion unravel where there's something that you're going to be like, you know what? I loved that ritual of having a green smoothie. I'm going to have a green smoothie three times a week. I just felt really awesome. My skin was glowing. Um, it was a great way to support my bowel regularity, my energy, yada, yada, yada. And that's going to stay in. And then I realized that, you know, the thing that I pulled out was that Clorox cleaning product and you know I started using branch basics and it's worked okay I'm gonna work my budget so I can just purchase that going forward and then the next time you do it it's I can't believe I'm never gonna drink out of plastics again glass you know glass only in the household or stainless steel inside or outside the household and I'm going to invest in reverse osmosis right there's always these layering um, I, I'm only going to buy a wild caught fish from now on or I'm going to order strategically to ensure this or I felt really good doing low carb. Now I'm keto curious and I'm gonna take that a step further. So again, you know, I have to provide a broad construct to give you guys framework, but think within yourself of a good, better, best approach. Like this evening I was sharing, I was doing um, taco bowls. So I started the detox today and I added, because of the detox, um, half of a lime on top of my bowl for a little bit more um, of the lime and all. Um, I also added uh, more cilantro than I normally would because cilantro aids to chelate toxic metals, also supports that glutathione status in the body. I um, added a half cup of raw chopped cabbage, red cabbage that I massaged with my hands and broke down and put that as the base of my bowl. I incorporated lacinato kale into the ground meat. I always add the kale, but the new changes were, you know, the, the cabbage, the more cilantro and the lime. And then whereas maybe I would choose a siete tortilla, siete tortillas, which are almond flour or cashew flour based and are grain free, still have xanthan gum um, and they still have um, tapioca flour. Whereas the siete chips 
are cleaner. They actually only have cassava flour and then all whole foods like chia seed, avocado oil. So if you needed to do a chip-like product, the Siete brand chip would work um, and not the tortilla. But again, where I am at my playing field, I was like, you know what? I'm not doing either of these because I want to make a little bit of a dynamic reset. So I want to take my step a little bit further and not do any of those starch-like fillers. And so I just did the cabbage and such. So there's a line, you know, and, and how can you modify and remove or add to just one up from where you're at, eyes on your own plate. Um, we're removing, of course, refined, processed, and artificial sweeteners. So as I said before, the dates, maple, um, and local honey, local raw and filtered honey are okay, though, um, again, in very small amounts. So I'm sure I'll be making pumpkin, um, the pumpkin uh, chocolate chip cookies with Stella. And again, how I'd have to modify is maybe only use cacao nibs um, or 100% cacao base, nothing that has like, you, you know, any added cane sugar in the chocolate or omit the chocolate completely or add some cacao powder into the recipe and then sub out the coconut sugar for probably a little bit of maple. So again, just kind of modifying and cleaning further. Um, no processed foods or food-like substances, no fried foods or um, rancid fats, um, no refined flour or gluten-containing grains the whole way through, farm-raised fish or conventional raised meat the whole way through. If you don't know the sourcing or the ranch or it doesn't say grass-fed pasture-raised or wild-caught, then try to keep it out. And that might mean that you're eating a little less animal during this 10 to detox. See how your body feels doing that. Maybe it honors it, maybe it doesn't, but think mindfully about your sourcing as a, a form of toxicity. So then as we go forward, as we get to day three, we kind of work up a bell curve. So now we pull out all remaining grains in case you were doing brown rice and quinoa in the beginning or like a blue heirloom corn in the beginning. Um, now, if you're following anti-anxiety diet, you wouldn't be doing that corn anyway. So again, where are you starting in the playing field? Um, dairy gets removed at days three onward, exception of the grass-fed whey and ghee. Um, nightshades are an option to remove at day five through 10, um, if, which is because of the solanine, which is one of the anti-nutrients in the potatoes, eggplant, bell peppers, and tomatoes that can cause a lot of joint inflammation and autoimmune activity. So my protocol will talk to you about considering that. If you don't experience those things, you may decide not to remove those and that's okay. Um, eggs, an option to remove at day three because eggs can tie so much with dermatological conditions like eczema, psoriasis. So if you're dealing with dermatological conditions or autoimmune condition, you might pull eggs out for days three through 10. Otherwise, you're going to want to keep them in for those yolks, that great sulfur powerhouse. And then legumes, if you had those in, um, you'd start to remove those at day seven on. So my protocol is a 60 page ebook. And this is what really has all of the kind of strategy and the food list and all the things. I sent you guys all a complimentary grocery list, um, which I'll resend to make sure, you know, I'm sure people have added on today joining the class. Um, but I will resend that, but I'm also gonna resend a link to the ebook, which has all of the strategic guidelines to learn about the reset your metabolism, restore your digestive health, and renew your cellular health. I'm gonna walk you through the big overhaul of them and then um, get a little deeper and then I'll ask, I'll take some Q&A. But the ebook, like I said, it's 60 pages. So it's a really deep dive and it'll give you, um, you know, really what you're doing as marching orders in a two day increment um, broken down. So it's days one and two, three and four, five and six, seven and eight, nine and 10. Um, so to reset your metabolism, we're looking at getting an abundance of these following compounds, brass fed whey, coconut oil, spices that include capsaicin, which is in your spicy um, peppers, turmeric and raw cacao, tea and matcha, and then if you're looking to layer in metabolic boosted support, the Boost and Burn supplement from my line has ribose and L-carnitine, which drives the carnitine synthase shuttle, which is the body's use of fat into fuel, shuttling fat into ketones, essentially. Um, so Boost and Burn is a great tool, and I like that much preferred over exogenous ketones, for instance, which just give your body the end product, but don't teach your body to do the work. I much prefer the Boost and Burn. 
Lifestyle support for resetting your metabolism would be things like hydrotherapy, which would be like a cold water bath or in your own shower, doing um, as hot as you can tolerate and then as cold as you can tolerate in the shower. Um, that's going to create this vasodilation and restriction, which constriction, which is going to create this lymphatic pumping essentially. Um, HIT or resistance training during this time, where you're kind of shifting metabolic um, reactivity, could work very favorably as well. Uh, in the first supplement within the Reset Restore Renew Packs is an antioxidant blend supplement. Um, this is going to be, oops, sorry about a little space here, um, going to be supportive on protecting your cells from the, again, liberated toxins that are released during a detox. So we're getting a high antioxidant blend to reduce the oxidative stress. Um, that can be generated during the detox process. Um, so these are gonna act as cofactors or basically activators to the detox enzymes. And within the antioxidant blend, um, we're going to be getting that EGCG um, from green tea, vitamin C, selenium, and acetylcysteine, providing a little bit of that sulfur and supporting glutathione, leucine, um, alpha lipoic acid, turmeric extract, and more. And that's in that first pill, the antioxidant blend. Then we're looking at the next R, which is restoring your digestive health. So we're looking for food as medicine support of probiotic foods. So um, if it is the two days of dairy, you could do raw aged dairy or yogurt. Otherwise, we're talking about sauerkraut, kimchi, kombucha. Um, we're looking at apple cider vinegar or lemon to stimulate that bile flow from the liver. Um, we're looking at bitters and dandelion greens to do the same thing, stimulate that bile flow, which is going to drive liver enzyme activity and also the emulsification or gathering of compounds. Um, and then chia seed also can support as a binder, if you will. Lifestyle support would be adequate hydration. So half of your body weight in fluid ounces. Um, and then looking at your uh, liver flush as a consideration of doing like a tablespoon or two of cider vinegar or lemon juice first thing in the morning. I'm going to get back to that tomorrow. I have not done that in like nine months plus, maybe a year plus. Um, so I think that's me. I'm going to challenge to later. And so I said, like, you, you'll forget about some health supporting things that work really well for your body that you just lost the habit of every time you do a detox. And it's like, oh yeah, that was really helpful. And then oil pulling with coconut oil is taking like a large spoonful of oil and um, the coconut oil and it will melt quickly in your mouth and you'll just kind of, and that pulling effect actually pulls the coconut oil into your periodontal tissue, very supportive for gum health. Um, caprylic acid and coconut oil can help to regulate your um, microbial activity. So if there is like candida in the mouth, the oral cavity, or if there is um, bacteria imbalance, it's gonna help to regulate that, reduce inflammation in the gums. It also fatigues your mandible, your jaw, so it can help to reduce um, jaw clenching in the evening and even like overeating in the evening fatigues the muscle. Um, so for phase one activity in the supplement, sorry, it's a blurry picture again. That was the antioxidant blend. The phase one blend is going to have um, vitamin A, particular B vitamins, taurine and inositol. Uh, we're going to get that dandelion root in there as well as artichoke, oxbile, cinolurin, which is seen in milk thistle um, and has been shown in research study to actually regenerate liver cells um, and beet powder, fringe tree. So these are all compounds that are bile, liver, gallbladder drivers to support the liver. And then the third R is to renew your cellular health. So again, the ebook will talk to you deeply about these food as medicine, including the bone broth, aliums and sulfur containing compounds, sulfur also in the mushrooms, sea vegetables, cruciferous veggies, pastured and wild caught protein. And then the lifestyle support will be adding sulfur with your Epsom salt bath at the MSM in there. Um, sun exposure also um, 15 minutes a day of, uh, I think I called it sunshine, soul shine. So taking 15 minutes of gratitude, expose your forearms, the part that doesn't really get a lot of sun um, because your liver and kidneys make your vitamin D as well. So it also supports the primary detox organs. Phase two supplement is called phase two detox supplement in the pack and it's the furthest to the right. It's the three white pills that you will see in all of your packs and it's going to have all of these listed sulfur containing compounds including glycine and, um, and acetylcysteine and um, we're also going to be getting your glutathione and your calcium deglucurate which can help with hormone regulation and estrogen dominance in the body. Um, like I said, most people have an imbalance of phase two activity and 
and when we see in you know cancer research and free radical overload there's a dynamic imbalance where there's more activation and less excretion. So the detox pack strategically have three phase two pills, one antioxidant blend, one phase one liver gallbladder blend. So you're getting that dominance of that encapsulation excretion throughout the process. So this is what the packs look like. I think we did sell out um, completely. So if you're listening to this at a timestamp that isn't December 2nd, 2019, then go on over to Allie Miller RD and purchase the Reset or Store Renew Detox Packs. Check them out. Um, and it's gonna be the best way to really biochemically support this turning of the wheel or this changing of the oil filter. The way you take the detox packs for those of you beautiful people listening that did your due diligence and purchased on the Black Friday deal, um, you're gonna take one pack at rise and rest, so morning and evening, and then um, all 10 days, and then days five through eight for those four days, you're gonna add an extra pack in the middle of the day. It could be taken with lunch or between meals, and um, you are going to be going through then, that would mean 24 packs through a 10-day detox. Each box has 60 packs in it, so you can invite a loved one to join in with you on this process, um, another family member, or you can just save those packs for the next three to four months. Um, I recommend doing a detox quarterly at minimum semi-annually. So, you know, if you do it now, then you'd be looking around March or so to consider your next cleanse. And then that only leaves a couple extra packs here and there for uh, times that you expose yourself to higher toxins. So if you are in wine country with girlfriends, I would be taking a detox pack every evening and every morning. Um, you know, or anytime you're having more than two alcohol beverages should always be taking a pack that evening and that next day. And then um, things like hair dye, being in a nail salon, if you know your occupation exposes yourself like in a petrochemical field or something like that, then you should be taking, you know, really a pack on a daily basis. Um, uh, there's really no need to stop any of the other naturally nourished supplements, but if you are taking ultimate detox, you consider holding that because ultimate detox is the phase two detox pill in your pack. Oh, and on that note, these phase two detox compounds and ultimate detox as a product, because they're very high in sulfur containing amino acids, they have a very strong sulfur odor. So no, your packs did not go bad. There's always gonna be a lot number and an expiration date, okay? Um, but they will have a little bit of like a, sour, a, a rotten egg scent to them. So just don't inhale them, just swallow them and you're all good. You shouldn't be belching or regurging that taste, um, but there is that, that sulfur noxious odor. So hydration, just a little bit further on this, I love to say that, you know, drinking water is the, one of the most powerful free diet supplements because the body goes through a process of lipolysis and lipolysis literally means the breaking of your fat cells using hydration. Um, so the breaking of um, your, your lipids or um, your fat cells and kind of liberating that. So when you're in a low calorie state and you're drinking water, that's gonna help with your body's metabolism of fat as fuel. I want you to get at least half of your body weight in fluid ounces daily. Um, this is going to also reduce the solute load. So you're getting less of a hit on your liver and kidneys as they're upregulating the filtration process. Um, I love uh, mountain uh, spring water with mountain valley spring water. It comes in a glass globe. I do that delivery. Um, I, I prefer spring water over reverse osmosis. We can talk about that another time, but definitely make sure that you're drinking filtered water and look to avoid plastics. Because remember, plastics, pesticides, and perfumes are those primary categories, there's a lot of P's in there, of your endocrine disrupting compounds. And then I would prefer you drink your fluid between your meals so that you're not diluting. You wanna dilute the solute in your bloodstream and help the you know, um, kidney turn blood into urine. Three, Frequent urination is great during a detox, but I don't want you diluting your stomach acidity. Remember, we want your stomach to be very highly acidic to activate the enzymes and break down the food particles. So I'd really prefer at mealtime, you really just sip to wet your whistle, but you drink the majority of your fluids separated from your meals at least 30 minutes uh, pre and post. Other lifestyle support to consider. So if you do well with that HIIT training, that might work well for you and that might be something to consider. 
Um, but if you're someone that's dealing with adrenal fatigue or chronic fatigue, you know, you might want to be gentle to yourself during a detox. Um, when you're taking my uh, detox packs, that's really when you're, again, medically, biochemically supporting detox. You could follow just the diet protocol and that would be clean eating and that would be great. But in order to really upregulate, we need that abundance of the nutrient strategy. And when you're taking the detox packs, some things to look for as like a side effect of a detox, which I always welcome because I'm like, oh, something's working, um, is that you might get a little bit of like... Um, like pre-flu aches, if you will. Um, and that's basically your body getting into the stagnant tissue and up-regulating -regu that liberation of that activation process and that encapsulation. So I always notice like just a little bit sore muscles in my arms or my legs. Um, I notice maybe a little bit of a headache, especially if I'm getting some caffeine withdrawal, if it had gone high coffee prior. Um, and in the first two to three days, sometimes a little bit of brain fog. But once I get to day five and over, it's like this huge recharge of energy. It's reduced inflammation. It's enhanced digestive function, deeper qualitative sleep. So all that stuff is coming. And, and you might get, though, a little bit of the like shifts of just your body doing some extra work, and, and that's okay. So these lifestyle elements will support even further the extra work that your body's doing. So I mentioned hydrotherapy. You also could use sauna. Um, an infrared sauna would be fantastic. Uh, sunlight and sauna, I have a partnership. If you use Allie Miller RD um, and you're considering purchasing a sauna and you reach out to them, they have like actually detox settings. They have cardiac settings um, and they've actually done a lot of um, research on their varied infrared far and near and how that impacts um, actually inside the body on the processes of detoxification. So that's pretty interesting. Um, sun exposure itself, as I mentioned already, you might do more gentle movement, especially if you are achier, so like resistance and moderate cardio, but using your muscles is important. Um, yoga, stretching, and twisting would be great too. Twists often um, move stagnation. So even like taking your legs and, you know, putting them to the side of your body and then letting that kind of drain and then switching sides at the end of the night, foam rolling, massage, all of that's really great for lymphatic tissue flow, um, as is exfoliating with a uh, dry brush. Um, and then the other thing I'd really just hit on lifestyle support is positive perspective. So you may consider journaling during this time. Um, we just did an episode on the podcast two weeks ago with Dr. Ryan Lowry where we talked about gratitude practice and gave some framework about taking it from being generic, you know, not just being like, I love my husband, I am grateful for uh, shelter um, and delicious food. It's being very specific of like, um, you know, the way my husband looked at me when he handed me my hot coffee, well, not during detox, but, you know, or um, the way my daughter giggled during dinner tonight. Um, so it's a little bit more specific and tangible, and that really helps to resonate and have more of like an oxytocin, actual hormonal connection to gratitude and um, can have a stronger impact on your perspective throughout the day. So food for thought there. And then again, on the perspective element, this is something you're choosing to do. Like you have the privilege to be empowered to take back control of your health. So nothing tastes as good as amazing feels. Nothing is going to mess with your hustle of putting yourself back in the driver's seat of the vehicle and feeling amazing in your body and not letting yourself just roll through the holidays, berating yourself and then trying to overcompensate and beat yourself up in January. Um, so this is a way for you to honor and nourish yourself and take it that in an empowered gratitude stance versus a victim mentality. There's no place for you to be the victim. You have to be the victor in this process and using food as medicine, you have to feel empowered by it. All right. So other supplements that you may consider if all this is like, holy crap, I'm in, I'm doing the tendon detox, but like, what do I do after that? I don't want these um, adipose sites, my fat cells to be bombarded with petrochemicals. What do I do? You know, how do I really stay super clean? And how do I support this biochemical reaction in the body? So these are just some food is thought, um, regular supplements that you might layer into your strategy. Super turmeric. Um, this is unique in the sense that it, it is one gram of turmeric curcuminoids 
per capsule is four to six times the bioavailability of any other turmeric, even at the same milligram dosage, which is a thousand milligrams in one gram. Um, and that's because it uses turmeric oil in its emulsification. So it's super bioavailable. Uh, turmeric, a high antioxidant, a liver supporter, both of phase one and phase two enzymes. It has the um, anti-inflammatory support. Um, supports glutathione stores in the body, so that'd be a big powerhouse for sure. Cellular Antiox is my glutathione product, so it has that S-acetyl glutathione, B6, and N-acetylcysteine, which is the, the building block to make glutathione. Um, this is one, both of these, well, I take all the things, so it's not fair to say, that's, I take them all actually. Um, but that's one that I take very regularly. Um, the Bio C Plus, as I mentioned, for especially histamine reactivity um, and uh, seasonal allergens, as well as you're getting into immune season, that's a good kind of thing to keep in the playing field and give that antioxidant capacity. Brocco detox would be more for, as I said, that phase two detox support, especially if there's familial uh, history of cancer risk. Ultimate Detox is the white pill in your Reset, Restore, and your Detox pack. So if you know that your work environment is high exposure, you might take two of those every night, or you might choose to keep based on your exposure and how you feel with either or the Reset, Restore, and new Detox packs where you keep one of those packs per night. Um, I think until midnight tonight, those of you that are watching this live, we're still keeping 20% off um, the EPA DHA Extra, which is our Omega-3, the Super Turmeric, and the Calm and Clear, and then the Detox Packs. Like I said, check if you haven't purchased them yet. I think they were just about to sell out if they haven't yet, um, but that is the code DETOX2019, and you will get 30% um, off the bundle, which includes the ebook and the supplements, um, or 20% off the supplements. So other ways to kind of upgrade post detox, and then I'll take a Q&A. Um, so uh, the ebook itself, if you have the supplements, but you're like, okay, this was super helpful, I'm inspired, I got it, I'm gonna trade out my condiments, I'm going to do this whole food thing, and break up with non-caloric sweeteners, but I still don't really know like what to eat on days one and two, as well as four and five. Then the um, Reset, Restore, Renew Detox ebook, um, I'm offering it at 70% off through, um, I'll, I'll let that go through Wednesday to give people a little bit more time to purchase that. Um, and so that comes down to like $4.99 and it's 60 plus pages. It's super information packed. It's worth it. Um, the virtual ketosis or adrenal rehab program are things to consider once you've done the 10 day detox and you get through those last couple weeks of December and you're like, okay, this was cool. What's next? What can I do now? Adrenal rehab is really focused more on burnout, running on adrenaline, feeling overextended, anxious, fatigued. And that's an evergreen course that you take at your own pace that you just get access to all three hours of video footage. It includes me cooking in my kitchen, tons of worksheets and handouts. And then the um, virtual food as medicine ketosis class is live. That is 12 week program. Um, each class has a different functional medicine topic that I teach. They're all the length of like this evening. Um, so we touch on hormones, insulin resistance, digestive health, leaky gut, HPA axis, and stress impact. And then we hit a lot of buzz topics for keto and troubleshooting, um, which includes intermittent fasting. We hit on carnivore, food sensitivities, cravings, carb cycling, and so much more. And you get a true type protocol with a lot of different kind of like algorithm type uh, protocols of where you'd fit, whether you want to do a, um, a fast track or more of a heal and maintain and gain protocol. And I'm going to give you different macros and all sorts of a really jump into next level. Um, for those people that are asking to work with me as a client, this is usually the best place to start. Even if you just want to stay phase two low glycemic and not go tight keto, you're going to learn so much. And all the functional medicine topics are so broad scope that it all comes back to keto and it all comes back to being a hybrid. That's really the, the, the impact of keto for those of you that aren't familiar with the term. Um, the body can run on both glucose or blood sugar and ketones, and it makes ketones when the body is restricted from food from fasting or just restricted from carbohydrates. 
And, you know, ancestrally, the body was running as a hybrid always on ketones and glucose, or if it would make an abundance of glucose um, from like a high starch that was discovered or whatnot, it would very quickly get back into a ketogenic state based on food scarcity or season or what have you. Um, but we're all really overly taxed metabolically with carbohydrate excess. And so we've lost the influence or the ability to produce nutritional ketones. Babies that are breastfed are actually making ketones. Babies in utero, regardless of mama's diet, are making ketones. So it's a very natural process for the body. And when you're able to adjust your diet and bring down your carbohydrate intake to get to a therapeutic level of ketone production, you are going to upregulate your body's ability to burn fat as fuel. You're going to maintain your body's lean body mass. You're going to get a lot of benefit in satiety, cognitive enhancement, clear um, thought processes, memory function, and, and a lot of really cool things that happen when we see a reduction of oxidative stress and inflammation. So that would be the next thing. Um, oh, goodness. Let me go back to a main screen. And we'll see if Becky can jump on here and share some questions. I see here view. Hey there, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Okay, cool. My video is not going to work, you guys, but I've been the one behind the scenes typing at you furiously <laughs> this whole time. Um, let me address these. Uh, there's only two that are still pending, so let's address these and then I'll go back and, and go over a couple of common questions. Um, I got a lot of questions around timing of the detox packs and um, whether they can be taken with thyroid medication, whether they can be taken if we are um, fasting for more of an extended window, like fasting until noon, and whether they would be okay taken closer to a meal if we're seeing that they upset our stomach. Yeah, so fasted, absolutely fine. Uh, they should not upset the stomach because they don't have minerals. And because they don't have minerals, I also would not worry about them with thyroid medication. Awesome. Okay. Um, so I always tell people, take them away from your thyroid just in case. But if... Yeah, if you could. Yeah. I mean, you could, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you're taking your thyroid at you know, 6 a.m. or whatnot, you could, you could take sure. it um, four hours separated. I don't, I've, I've not clinically seen an impact um, or a concern. And definitely an empty stomach, no concern. Okay. Um, and what about with food? Um, you could take them with food, though. Yeah, most okay. definitely. Cool. Um, and then this other question, is there a specific reason certain foods are left in, taken out on certain days? Is it okay to just remove all dairy all 10 days and not start day three? Yeah, totally. So if you know, again, everyone's starting at different entry points. So if you know that a food doesn't serve you or you've already had it out, there'd be no reason to bring it in just because it's allowed in the protocol. Um, so you may ride out, for instance, all of the 10 days of the 10 day detox at days like four and five and just cruise control. What I would recommend is using the other days of the abundance food goals to just mess with yourself a little bit to kind of upregulate particular strategic nutrients. Like maybe you make a chia seed pudding, um, you know, for two of those days. Maybe you do a turmeric golden milk latte um, where you incorporate the whey protein. So you can use it also just in an abundance based approach and keep your diet pretty sound, but again, kind of modifying from your start point, like I gave the example with the taco salad, um, you know, where's your now, and, and, and knowing what you've just learned and what you see in the, in the materials, how can you accelerate? Now, I'll just address right now because it might be coming up. Um, there's two days of the protocol that are to be uh, like a digestive reset time frame um, where we um, would have just eggs and wild caught fish and shakes or even optional of just the shakes for the protein um, and it's really to be like a deeper lower calorie day um, so that would mean if you're doing two scoops of the grass-fed whey that you're getting 48 grams of protein there and then if you're doing like three to four eggs um, you know then that's going to be getting like 21 to 28 grams of protein so you'd be dancing to that minimum of 60 and that would potentially work for some people and just be a way to kind of reset their GI tract because they're drinking their meals majority and then just the really simple eggs. Now, if you've had the eggs out, you'll see that legumes are allowed during that time as well. So it's also a time frame for some people to just, you know, reduce their protein intake and see how they feel. If you know you don't do well with legumes and you don't want to bring them back in and you 
know that you do poorly without protein, there's no reason otherwise than just mixing up the protocol to keep in something like a grass-fed ribeye or a wild-caught salmon piece of fish. But I was bringing fish and eggs as an emphasis of just being like a really easy, that was really an easy to digest couple days. So that was the, the rhyme and reason for that. That was my next question. So you, you answered it. Someone on the Facebook had asked if we get a bone broth during those days. And that's kind of how I'm planning on doing that portion is more like smoothie for my lunchtime meal and then um, doing like a bone broth based soup with either fish or, or eggs as the protein. So I think that can work really nice. Totally what I'm going to do. So I love to do a little bit of organic miso with bone broth and then I'll just take like a white fish, like a halibut filet that I thaw and I'll just actually throw chunks of it raw into the soup and just let it kind of poach. It's so easy. And then a bunch of scallions and sesame seeds. Yep. And if you're doing eggs, you can like drop an egg in there and kind of scramble it up like an egg drop soup, which is what I've been eating the past two days. So all of that would be good. Um, a lot of people just mourning their loss of coffee. So can we give them a why? <laughs> well, it's just the emphasis of getting more of the EGCG from tea. So, you know, like organic fruit. And again, like I said, I, I have seen clinically when coffee is removed from many people, including myself, that often there's a favorable outcome from the adrenals, deeper qualitative restful sleep. There's just different ways that we metabolize um, coffee in the body, and it's a time to try that. Now, good, better, best, if that means that you're going to get staunch and be like, well, I'm not doing a detox because I'm not going to give up my coffee, maybe your perspective is keep coffee, but do a half cap, or maybe instead of buying coffee out, you do a French press of a known quality roasted fair trade organic coffee and you watch what you add to it and you know you pull out the dairy from it or you pull out the um creamer that you're using you know another like veiled health product creamer or something that has ingredients that aren't whole real foods okay. awesome um <laughs> strong smell to the packs we addressed that yeah, i'm glad you very did accurate. <laughs> Ooh, how about this one? Can you chew gum during the detox? Tell them what you think about gum chewing. <laughs> <laughs> that is disgusting. <laughs> um, I do. Um, no, you really can't. A couple reasons. One is that, so the natural gums are still going to have cane sugar in them. Some may have xylitol. That's already a processed food, though. That's derived from corn. It's not a whole real food. I don't have any gums that are whole real food based. Um, there's cleaner than... Um, but gum chewing also stimulates your digestive process and it can play with your satiety signaling. So a lot of people that chew gum tend to overeat. Yep. Okay. Plus it just doesn't look cute. So try to stop. <laughs> you could do those, um, what are they, the like cinnamon um, toothpicks? Picks, or, or like, um, you know, essential oil sprays mm -hmm. or yep. what have you. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I hit everything else big. Um, let's just address um, working out during the detox because I had a few questions around that and, and kind of what that should look like. Yeah, like I said, it's kind of your starting point. So like in the ebook, I'll talk a lot under that resetting your metabolism to do HIIT training because for people's metabolism that needs like a reset button, especially if they've been more stagnant, then for them something like a spin class or a boot camp or um, CrossFit type thing might work really beautifully, especially if they are holding on to extra body weight and they want to do something that kind of revs things up. Um, with that being said, like I said, individuals that are dealing with known adrenal fatigue and know that this is a time of the year where they're already sleep deprived and overstressed, it would be much favorable for those individuals to do more of like a yoga, Pilates, moderate resistance training, but still allowing like stretch and movement that keeps you cadent. Um, I always talk about, as you guys know, with the anti-anxiety diet stuff, really not using exercise as a chosen stressor, but helping exercise be a safety reset for your system. Again, with that being said though, we're talking to people all across the board. So it's kind of just figuring out where you belong based on your baseline. Awesome. And did we pull up to the very last slide where I added the social sharing and stuff? I don't know if we ever got. Oh, yours isn't. I, I, I uh -huh. have a That's okay. Just tell, tell the people where to find you on Instagram and um, about social sharing for the detox and any other support um, that we'll be offering during that time. 
Yeah, so everything's at Allie Miller RD on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, although Twitter just takes my Instagram feed, as does Facebook, really. But I'm going to be most engaged on uh, Facebook and Instagram. Um, did you create a hashtag? I didn't see it, Becky. So I did not. I just had encouraged social sharing at, at Allie Miller RD. Yeah, so just tag me um, in all of your detox posts. Um, I'm just calling it 10 Day Real Food Detox. Um, so it could be, you know, hashtag 10 Day Real Food Detox or hashtag Naturally Nourished, um, you know, whatever you want to use. But you could tag at Allie Miller D. I'd love to see you guys share your experience through the process. I'll be sharing daily what I'm doing. Um, and I hope that, it, again, don't the devil's in the details. Don't allow yourself to get really myopic of like the, the rule following. You know where you're at. You know where you would be in the holidays without this type of a plan or program. So be you in the best version of yourself that takes the time to nourish and honor. So, you know, I'm already thinking about getting excited about when I can bring back in fruit because I never eat fruit, but just knowing that I can't have it based on the protocol. I like really, I'm already thinking Brady about these um, apple, um, uh, pink lady apples and I'm like ooh I'm gonna have a half of that with like brown almond butter and I haven't done that we have those foods all the time for Stella but because I live keto I don't really go for those but that's gonna be something that I'm gonna indulge in with like a lot of cinnamon and pumpkin pie spice and my almond butter on probably Saturday night you know whereas my other version of myself would probably have two glasses of red wine but no fruit um, so you know just kind of playing with variants within the body focusing on what you're doing to reset your system. And again, every time you do this, what's one layer of something that you're gonna keep in? What's one layer of something that you're gonna keep out? And you just keep moving that dot forward. Um, so thanks for joining me tonight. I'm super honored uh, that you guys took the time to listen to my spiel on toxic um, overload within our environment and our uh, food industry. I hope that this has impacted you and you want to share this with family or friends. I'm going to be uploading it to my YouTube channel, um, which is Naturally Nourished on YouTube, just like the name of the podcast. And um, I hope that you all have a fantastic process and really enjoy the journey of honoring and nourishing yourself throughout the entire holiday season and starting the new year strong. Have a good one, guys. Bye, y'all. Bye.